Why? According to my parents, this was a question I asked a lot as a child. I like to think it was a, a sense of my thirst for knowledge, quite an endearing characteristic in a child, but I'm not sure my parents would agree. Growing up in the 1980s, um, in rural England, I had relatively few sources of information available to me. I was fortunate that I had a, an encyclopedia and several of the textbooks, but once the knowledge in those books was exhausted, and the knowledge of my parents was exhausted as well, I was often left with an incomplete answer to my latest, why? Then came the 25th of December, 1990. The nine-year-old me would have been at home in a sea of shreddy wrapping paper with our latest Lego creation, blissfully unaware that this day marked an important step on the journey to the information age that we now enjoy, and the ability for me to answer practically any why question I could conceive of. This is the day that Tim Berners-Lee, creator of the World Wide Web, used the first ever web browser to access the first web page over the internet. If I was to ask you, do duck quacks echo? And if they don't, why not? How would you start to answer that question without using the web? I can see a few of you considering wrestling an irate duck into a tunnel, but <laughs> not necessary. Happily, the web and your smartphone puts the answer quite literally at your fingertips, even here in a TED talk. Although if you can resist the urge to Google search that right now, I'd appreciate it. So clearly the web has changed how we seek out new information. It's granted us access to more diverse sources and more detail than ever before. But have we given technology too much control over the information we get to see? Is there anything we can do to take back some of that control? Now, when you're searching for a new piece of information, whether it's about duck quacks or anything else, you're probably going to start with a search engine. Now, search engines use complex maths, lots of computing power, and massive amounts of data to act as the middleman between you and your questions, and the billion or so websites out there that might hold the answer. Now, the data they use is not just from the sites with the information on offer. It's also from you. And I don't just mean what you typed in, in the first place. I mean things like your location, which helps them better answer questions like, where can I find a good Italian restaurant? No good giving you the answer for the middle of Italy if you're in the middle of London. It might also mean things like your previous searches and the results you clicked on from them, which might give away things like your favorite sports team, your religious or maybe political views. And a search engine may then use that information to prioritize information and news that's relevant to you, your interests and views. Now, this curation of your search results can lead to what's been referred to as a filter bubble, where the information you see in that first page or two of the results is the right answers for you, but can make it harder for you to see the bigger picture, the view from the opposite side of the political divide, or perhaps that little Italian restaurant on the outskirts of town that's worth the journey to go and visit. The challenge here is, how do you assess the impact of that? If something's buried deep in the search results, so deep that it might as well be missing entirely, how do you know? Search engines don't just filter results though, to make sure you find the right information. They also do it to make sure you don't find the wrong information. As fake news made big headlines in the real news, so the web's been challenged to help mitigate some of the implications of this worrying new trend, a trend that some believe actually had a material impact in the 2016 US presidential election. But even well-intentioned initiatives can have unintended consequences. Google's recent updates to its search algorithms to help weed out fake news have already been accused of actually removing some search results from some fringe political websites, which strongly refute any allegations of being fake news. Here, so here Google is actually acting as an arbiter of what is a trustworthy news source, and then censoring legitimate political discussion in the hopes of saving us from being misinformed. The challenge again is, how do you assess the impact of that? If a search engine chooses to just not show a site in their search results, because they're trying to save you from being misinformed, how do you know? Sadly, the challenge doesn't end with search engines. Sorry. Information now more than ever is being presented to you. You've probably seen some today. It was there in your news feeds, in between that picture of your friend's family holiday and that funny video of a cat falling over. Not searched for, not asked for, answering a question you hadn't even asked. It's there because sites like Facebook and other social media sites also use big data and complex algorithms to decide what to show you, whether it's the pages from, sorry, the shares from the pages you follow, or perhaps the status updates from your friends. Because, well, clearly it's not practical to show you everything, every status update, every share, because, well, I know how popular you all are. They, they curate our timelines based on their very intimate knowledge of us, from the things we like, our friends, the things our friends like, the groups we're members of, and the content we interact with, both on Facebook itself, but also across the web, thanks to the ever-present like button. Think for a second, though. With this intimate knowledge of us, 
What prompts a social media site to show us something it knows we don't like? Or something that's going to challenge us religiously, politically, socially? And if a social media site chooses to show us only the updates from a small group of our friends, perhaps the ones we interact with most frequently, or a certain group of pages, how do you know? Think back to June 2016. Sorry. What I've described there is a technical incarnation of a very human tendency to focus on information which reinforces our existing views and to dismiss or ignore information which challenges it. This digital confirmation bias has led to sites like Facebook being labelled as an echo chamber, as an echo chamber, as an echo chamber. Because of its ability to reinforce our existing views, our likes, based on what they present back to us in our news feeds. Think back to June 2016. <laughs> the result of the Brexit referendum. How shocked by or sure of that result were you? Think back to what you saw and heard on social media in the run-up to that result. Did it convince you that your side of the argument was going to emerge victorious? If that has a ring of truth to it, consider how that echo chamber effect might change a voter's decision-making. The Brexit referendum saw the highest turnouts in parts of the country with the highest proportion of older voters, arguably those less likely to use social media and therefore less likely to be influenced by this phenomenon. For social media users, though, could that echo chamber have so convinced them of the result that they decided, actually, there's no need to go out and vote at all? But that's even a possibility, highlights the implications of curating and filtering the information we get to see and the decisions we take as a result of it. Decisions which might just affect us as individuals, but can have far more wide-reaching implications. Now, the challenges I've described are technical issues that exist not because of an intent to mislead or misinform you, but actually out of a desire to create a more accurate search result or a more relevant timeline. But these are technical problems that are challenging to solve with technical solutions. How do you tell Google, stop being so good at answering my questions? Start throwing in some answers I didn't know I wanted to hear? All without looking like an incompetent search engine. How do you tell social media sites, show me everything, including things I don't like, the things that are going to challenge me, that might put me off from coming back to your site? So these are technical problems that need human solutions. We need to take back control. We need to investigate and dig deeper into the information we see, using the skills we have, maybe by developing a few new ones. Skills like human curiosity can help you seek out alternative viewpoints and drive you to actually understand them. Basic skills like mathematics can help you analyse information that's used to support an argument or make a case. When it comes to the web, digital literacy can help you use the web and its tools more effectively to get to the information you're looking for. But if I was to pick out one skill that I believe can be most useful in dealing with these types of challenges, it's critical thinking. Because it's a skill that doesn't just help with the information we encounter on the web, it also helps in our offline lives as well. It's the ability to develop a healthy scepticism about what we see and pushes us to ask more questions to better assess the information we're presented with so that the views we form or decisions we take as a result are considered, rational, informed. Now, sadly, critical thinking is typically only taught in higher education. Happily, though, there are many free resources available on the web to teach yourself and others this valuable skill. You can find them very easily using your search engine, the irony of which is not lost on me. Now, given the relatively short amount of time we have together today, it was never going to be practical for me to teach you critical thinking. But maybe what I can do is give you some simple questions to take away to help you think more critically the next time you're reading something online, or perhaps even in the newspaper. Start with what? What is this article trying to convince me of? Is it of a preconceived notion, or the author's conclusion about something, or are they presenting their case and allowing me to come to my own? Next, consider how. How are they trying to convince me? Are they presenting facts and figures and referenceable sources, or are they simply playing upon my emotions? Finally, perhaps, why? Why are they trying to convince me of this view? Is there a political motivation underneath? Is there an axe to grind on behalf of the author? Or are they simply trying to inform their readership? What, how, and why? Three simple questions. Today, we find ourselves at a point in time where information is more accessible with greater diversity and depth than ever before. So I don't want anyone to leave today being scared of using the web and technology. 
I'm a passionate technologist, and I believe that technology has the potential to open up so many avenues for us. And I want people to use technology to its fullest extent. But clearly, it can be imperfect. And it's important that we develop skills to protect ourselves from the occasions when it is. Let's leave you with one final thought. I've offered some insights into the challenges that technology can present. And based on my background, and the fact that I'm still on this TEDx stage, you might assume that I speak from a position of authority. And the facts and figures that I've discussed have been well-researched and thoroughly reviewed. I might also tell you that duck quacks do, in fact, echo. And I might be telling the truth, but how do you know? Thank you.